I want to talk about something slightly different. I want to talk about what does it take to, to really establish a DevOps culture in a large organization. And much of those is, that is based on my experience at a large insurance company. And, and we titled this, you know, intentionally a little bit controversially, right? If you think you're adopting DevOps, then you're probably already heading, already heading the wrong direction. And I'll show you why I believe that is the case in large organizations. So the first thing when, when companies talk about DevOps, the, the key driver they generally have is their IT is too expensive and too slow. They want to speed things up. And additionally, you know, when you ask a project manager to speed things up, they pull out, this is yeah, project management 101, the first lesson you get, right? the project management triangle. So what this means is you have a certain scope of work, you have a set of available resources, and therefore the work takes a certain amount of time. You're trying to stack up a thousand bricks into a wall, it takes a whole day. If you have one person, if you have two people, it takes half a day. And then most dangerously, dangerously in the middle is this quality thing, right? And that makes you believe that if you do a poor job, right, you can do it in two or three hours as, a, as opposed to half a day. Now, I have stood up in front of a room of um, about 20 or 30 senior executives and I ask them, do you, know, do you have IT managers who use this model? And like about like 10, 15 hands went up, and I said, fire them. And I said, OK, well, not really, right? But have a serious talk with them, because if somebody manages software projects like this, they haven't, they fundamentally haven't understood how software delivery works. Software delivery has very different levers. Somehow I need to get this in. Has very different levers, and those levers are the following three. The biggest reason software delivery is slow because there's too much friction in the system. And friction is a dangerous thing. It's like I would say, it's like an engine that is running, but the bearings are tight. Somehow there's no oil in the engine, right? Somehow you put a lot of energy in, but not as much comes out. And the worst part about it is if you put more energy in, usually the friction also goes up, right? If you step on the gas, you get more resistance until ultimately the whole thing overheats and breaks. Now, the catch with that is this friction is usually not visible, right? It's somehow, somehow things are not spinning freely, and the same is true in software. So friction is waiting for a server to be provisioned, right? That's friction. Somebody's sitting there waiting two weeks, waiting for your development environment to be set up, waiting for your build to be done. But it's also ordering equipment or chairs or pencils for your team, or it can also be getting an approval, waiting for a steering committee, waiting for somebody to make a decision, right? All that is friction, right? And you can easily see that getting that out of the game is really going to speed up your delivery because that's one of the biggest inhibitors. The second biggest lever you have is inventory. Now, in software, we don't think so much about having inventory, right? Because inventory is usually stuff that piles up, right? Inventory is a very bad thing. Inventory is something that has incurred the cost, something that has been manufactured, but that hasn't been sold yet. And to make it worse, there's the notion of unfinished inventory. That is also something that has incurred the cost, but it can't be sold because some piece is missing, right? It's like a lot full of cars that don't have an ignition key, right? That is the worst case, right? And obviously, nobody's happy about having produced something, having spent the money, and not having the, the return on it. Now, in software, we think we don't have this problem, but we do. Any software that is not in production is inventory. Right? We have a source repository full of source code. That is inventory, unless it's in production, unless it's in the customer's hands. And you can easily do the math. The company I worked for, we had a very large system. We released about every six months. So you can say like you know, 200 working days in a year, roughly, roughly. So it's 100 working days, 100 people on the project. So it's 10,000 persons software inventory, because it's not released. And this was in Europe, so make the math easy. You say it's about 1,000 euros a day. Day rate for the contractors is a boom. 10 million euros inventory sitting there, right? Cost incurred, money spent, nothing gotten out of it, right? So that you need to reduce. Because that is just money that's essentially wasted, or at least temporarily wasted, because it's just sitting there not doing anything. The next part about inventory, the next danger about inventory is that inventory rots, right? These cars that sit on the lot, Next week, they're still worth as much as this week. That's fine. But a few months down the road, when the new model year comes, they don't, they're not worth as much anymore, right? The inventory decreases in value. It's not like you can buffer as much inventory as you want. It's going to rot. And software does the same thing. 
because people will forget what they did, right? They have to look at it again. Software rots just as much. So getting inventory down is your second, second biggest lever. The third one seems also obvious, but it's also a, a giant one that's, in my opinion, not nearly used as much. And that is, don't do stuff that is not needed. Right? Or rather, we should say, don't do things that don't provide value for the business. Right? Easier said than done, because often you have a business user says, oh, this is really important. Or the existing system does it this way. Right? So you are kind of bound by the need and say, oh, no, this is really critical. And then you build it, and you find out nobody actually uses it. Right? It provides no value. Just somebody thought it was going to be important and useful. Now, those are the three levers, right? Not the project management triangle. Those are the three things if you want to speed up software. Those are the three things you need to do. And interestingly, if you translate this into the buzzwords, those are really the three major shifts in software delivery that we have, right? Reducing friction, that is really what DevOps is all about. Reducing inventory, right? This is all from Toyota and Japanese car companies in the 50s and 60s, right? That is the lean story. The funny part there is we always feel like we IT people, we're sort of smarter and faster than anybody else. We always feel we invent everything quicker. In this case, we're half a century behind, essentially. Right? So they learned this in the 60s. Now we are like, oh, lean, fantastic. Right? Finally, finally, we saw the light. And the main reason is because our inventory is less visible. Right? That's why it took us longer to understand this. But economics is exactly the same. And the last one, that's the essence of Agile. You know, Agile teaches you to build things of value. Agile teaches you to maximize the value you're delivering and not to deliver stuff that doesn't have any value. So in a sense, right, we throw these buzzwords around a lot. In the end, it's simple economics, right? This is all about getting the most out of software delivery. This is not like all oh, the developers want to have chaos and freedom and not write documentation, all this kind of stuff that people stick on these methods, right? That's, that's all bogus, right? It's really about simple economics, right? Get the friction out, get the inventory out, and only build stuff that provides value. That way you get the most out of every development dollar you spend. It's very logical, and that's where these methods come from. There's no magic behind it. And correspondingly, that's my favorite definition of DevOps, right? It's out of Len Bass's book. A lot of people say, oh, DevOps is about making Dev and Ops work together. And then other people say, oh, DevOps is like Chef and Puppet and Salt, etc." right? Those are all like little pieces of it. This is what DevOps is all about. It's a set of practices, and I would even say a set of practices and tools probably that minimize the time, right, between a change and it going into production with high quality, right? Not an emergency patch, but a regular release, right? And that's why I like this definition because that is the driver. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions people have is that these agile methods and some of these other methods are less disciplined, right? They're like, oh, it's the, it's the revenge of the cowboy coders, right? Oh, we're agile, we kind of do whatever we want, right? And I've heard this so many times in an organization. You ask somebody, when is the meeting? Oh, we don't know yet because we're agile. Right? It's like, yeah, I, I want to strangle those people, right? Because they really abuse you know, the term. Agile is a more disciplined way of working because it's very easy if you try to go fast and you don't have discipline. That is the best recipe for chaos. The example I often give is an F1 pit stop. Right? About the fastest manual process you can imagine is Formula One, the car comes in for a pit stop. In four seconds, the car has four new tires, they wipe the windshield, and in the old days, they even put fuel in the car in four seconds. Right? Now, is that the most disciplined process on earth? Yes, absolutely. They practice this a thousand times. Everybody knows exactly what they're going to do. There's no unknowns. It's like the perfect execution. So that's a great example. If you want to be quick, you want to be disciplined. Because at the pit stop, people don't start debating who changes which tire and whether it really needs to be changed. Right? And this is true in Agile in these methods. And there's a nice analogy for my, my friend here. It's like Usain Bolt, right? It's like who, who broke all the records for, for sprinting. right? The one thing is, you know, don't make a single mistake, right? You gotta be basically say one suboptimal move ruins your game. So you gotta really run very, very disciplined, but you also have to have confidence, right? So you can see the nice picture where the one guy's like, oh, I'm gonna win, right? And the other guy just kind of just goes past him, right? And that's very important because the discipline gives you the confidence. The example I use is, how do you measure test coverage? A lot of people say, oh, you should have 
85, 75, yeah, whatever. People start talking about the numbers. So I say, this is not the purpose of unit testing. Right? The purpose of unit testing is to give you confidence. Because right? if you don't have confidence, if you hesitate, you will never be fast. Right? If the F1 pit car comes in and you're like not sure your, your screwdriver works the thing to unmount the wheel or whether the screw is really tight, that is not going to be four seconds, right? That's going to be four minutes because you're like, mm, I'm not sure, right? If you're not confident, you're not going to move, you're going to hesitate. So what is the main purpose of unit test coverage? The main purpose of unit test coverage is to give you confidence, right? The way you measure this, you go to a team and you say, great, I'm gonna, you're going to look the other way for a few minutes. I'm going to go in your source code and I'm randomly going to delete you know, 10 lines of code or make some random changes. I change a one to a two, a two to a zero. I take this line out. I invert this if statement, right? I just, you know, monkey your code up a tiny bit. Don't worry, version control, right? And then if your build stays green, we push this straight into production, right? That is the test whether you have correct unit test coverage, right? Because if the team goes, oh my God, right? And they all start looking for a new job, right? Then you know their test coverage is insufficient. If they say, be my guest, then you know the test coverage is sufficient, right? And that is the purpose to give you the confidence and together the discipline and the confidence, right? Discipline means no check-ins on red, right? Disciplines means, you know, everybody uses version control. Discipline can also be minimize branching, put everything on trunk, right? That is all discipline combined with the confidence in your tool chain that actually, you know, if something is wrong with your code, you find out early, that's what makes you fast, right? And this is what's the driver behind this whole story. So, sounds really good. Now, putting this into the large enterprise can make you feel like this guy. Um, this is Don Quixote chasing the windmills, right? And these are the corporate windmills. So, as great as these ideas are, getting this to work in a large organization isn't as easy as it should be. The first problem is, in a traditional organization, they often change operations from development. Right? It's the classic change versus run, they call that Y word. And I was like, what is that, right? So change is application development, and run is operations. Now, of course, you can easily see how this is a bad thing, because the idea is here that run doesn't make any changes. So how can you, do you get in a continuous integration delivery mode if operational software is not supposed to change, right? Something, something is broken here, because in a digital world, what you actually like to do you like to put things into production as quickly as possible, because otherwise it's inventory, and you like to learn what people do with it. You like to improve. You put it in production so you can make meaningful changes. Right? The traditional enterprise puts things into production, and they think they are done. Right? So in the new world, in the digital world, software starts when things put in production. Right? Because anything before then is just like warm-up. Right? The software delivery really starts once the first thing is in production, in the traditional model, they believe the project ends when something goes into production. Right? It's completely the opposite, and that makes this difficult. Now, what this also leads to is that generally the development team and the operations team, they have a little bit of a strained relationship with each other. Right? So the developers, of course, we feel like we're the kingmakers, right? Developers, we're like, yeah, at least as cool as Neo, we can hack everything, we can make everything work. And basically, the operations are a bunch of old farts who just haven't kept up with technology, right? So this is kind of the, the common view, right? And of course, the opposite view is also true. Operations is like the guardians of the universe, right? Because these developers, they just break everything all the time. And if it wasn't for us operations people, right, this whole thing would be like a kindergarten, right? It would be like you know, all these little kids just messing everything up. So you can see that there's going to be a little bit of an uneasy relationship between the two, two teams. And of course, that is going to generate friction, right? This is not going to get friction out of the system. This puts friction into the system because the operations people say, whoa, 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 with your software release, right? This is a bunch, bunch of you know, stuff full of bugs you guys have there. Let me go to my 27-step release process for this to go into operations, right? And that's where a lot of the, the friction comes from. And what this leads to, right, in operations, one of the most popular slogans you will hear is, never touch a running system, right? Everybody's heard that slogan. Now, why don't they touch a running system? Because they equate, you know, if you touch it, they think you break it. So they equate change to risk. Right? 
And I had this discussion, I work a lot with financial services companies, and they say, oh, we're a risk-averse company. And I say, so should you be, right? I, you don't want to have a risky bank, right? You don't want to have a bank where the CEO goes gambling every weekend, right? It's just sort of, right? So yes, you are a financial services institution, so obviously you should be risk-averse because you're keeping my money and I want it back, right? But risk-averse doesn't mean change-averse. Right? They have this belief baked in, they're two different things. But this little slogan, never touch a running system, sort of really personifies their belief that every change is a risk, and in order for them to bring the risk down, because rightly so, they're risk averse, in order to bring this down, they believe they have to minimize the change. And you can also see, you can say like, oh, this is not right, but you can also see how hard that is to change. Right? Because in their view, they're doing absolutely the right thing. Right? We are a bank, we're risk averse, touching stuff breaks things, so therefore change is risk. So the logical conclusion is minimize the change. Right? It's 100% logical, so it's very difficult to argue against this. Right? Because you say, oh, let's just change stuff left and right. They're going to go, oh, oh, no, no, no. Right? So you need to convince people that you have different mechanisms at play. There is a reason you can reduce the risk of change. And a lot of the DevOps and all the other uh, methods we used recently, their main purpose is to reduce and minimize the risk of change. Right? And this is where a lot of you know, the Google you know, SRE, the site reliability engineering, a lot of it comes from that perspective. Right? Fully automate your operations because once things are fully automated, it's much easier to do and undo things. You don't have human error. Right? It's all this, you can make smaller releases. You can do green-blue deployments, right? This enables all the mechanisms that minimize the risk of change as opposed to just minimizing the change. But you have to acknowledge that this is a big shift in mindset, right? And as I said, it's not because the people don't know. You're not teaching them something new in a sense. You have to unteach them an existing belief, right? Because they are, in their view, being fully rational. Right? We've seen this a thousand times. People made a change, it broke. So therefore, we don't make as many changes. They have proof for their belief, right? and they are fully rational. So changing that is hard. Right? And that's why I'm saying just adopting DevOps in a large organization is unlikely to work. You need to really understand how people think, and you need to demonstrate what has fundamentally changed so you can use different mechanisms that still fulfill the goal of being risk averse, right? Nobody argues with that. So here's, to make this even more clear, here's um, the challenge you're up against. In a culture that has high friction, doing anything is difficult, right? And difficult means time invested, time invested means money spent, right? So it's high invest, you know, doing anything, right? Doing anything will lead to a high invest. Now, if there's a high invest, right, there's a lot at stake. If you want to try a new product, and this new product costs $10 million US dollars, right? People will be very careful, right? Because a lot of money going around. Right? Of course, what they will do is they will say, let's check everything very carefully to make sure these $10 million are wisely spent, right? Quality control, project review, steering review, approval, 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 review, quality gate, right? They will have a lot of controls in there because there's a lot of money at stake. And of course, unfortunately, what this does, you can see this right here, right? The more controls bring more friction, right? Because now, instead of writing software, you're preparing for the steering meeting. You're filing the weekly status report. You're doing the quarterly budget approval process, right? So you actually increase the cost because you increase the friction, and that is a very dangerous cycle, right? It keeps sort of spinning this way. No, now, in order to change that, you need to stop you need to stop it from spinning the wrong direction, and then you can get it to spin the right direction. So it's quite a bit of effort involved there. It's not about, oh, you know, I have you know, Jenkins and Puppet, you know, now I'm DevOps. That is not going to do the trick. What you want, you want to take the friction out of the system, because once you do that, it's much easier and therefore cheaper to do things. So now this new product you're trying to launch, maybe that costs you 10,000 US dollars. Not a trivial amount of money, but for company, a lot better than 10 million or 1 million, right? They're like, okay, $10,000, go ahead, right? There's less at stake, you will get support. They're like, oh, go ahead, let me know how this goes. Google is very much like this, and sometimes people believe it's because, oh, we have so much money, or we're kind of loosey-goosey. No, 
That's not the reason we can, we can have this nice cycle. The cycle is we try small things. We make small iterations. We have low friction. So when somebody says, go give it a try, they're not going to spend $10 million on this, right? They're going to spend 10000 or maybe 50000 right? So that's why the organization can be an enabling organization because the friction is low, the cycles are short, and therefore you can try things very, very quickly and cheaply, and you can learn very quickly. That's why Google can do that. So just throwing money at the problem is not the solution. You need to get the friction out, and you need to get into an enablement cycle without and, and, and killing the disablement cycle. Right? But again, this shows you how hard it is to get this turning one way or the other, because the existing system is self-supporting. Right? The existing system self-perpetuates in a negative way. Right? So you need to stop it first and then get it going the other way. Right? And that's why introducing DevOps is, is quite a, um, you know, not as trivial task. So what the large organizations often do, and this is the biggest anti-pattern, you know, James Lewis yesterday was, was joking, if you have a DevOps team, you're already a little bit in trouble. I think you're even more trouble if you have the head of DevOps, right? Because, you know, what is this person going to do? And if you guys don't know this space, see, this is like Lumberg from the office space, right? It's the ultimate sort of silly manager. I need you to fill out this status report, basically, right? This is what you get in these large organizations. Oh, I picked up this buzzwords. And now I need you to speed up my software delivery because of this DevOps thing I heard about. Right? So this is what large organizations tend to do. And I've seen this. I have seen heads of DevOps who couldn't code a line of code. Right? So it's like totally not technical. Right? But somehow they were going to do this DevOps thing. Of course, it's an absolute joke. doesn't work. Right? Oops. Do I have a... So... What does work, right? How do you get this, this efficient way of doing things? And I said, much of this is inspired by the automotive industry. How do you get this into the enterprise? So the first thing, you need to fix this change story I talked about, right? A traditional enterprise is geared towards change is abnormal, right? They think change is risk, so they don't like change. That's why they work in projects, right? We said change versus run, right? Run is continuous, but doesn't like change. And change is projects, and these projects are very tightly packaged into a budget, right? There's a project budget, the project starts, and everybody's kind of happy when the project ends, right? Because, to be blunt, that for them is the unusual state, right? That's the one they're not so comfortable with, right? That's, you know, because change breaks things. That has to be abandoned, right? And a lot of people have the slogan, projects versus products, right? I always say at Google, yeah, when does a project end, right? Like, when does Gmail end? I don't know. Hopefully never, right? Google Wave did end, right? Our projects end when the product is dead in the market, right? Otherwise, you know, it keeps going. You keep improving, right? There isn't a project with a beginning and an end for a digital product. As soon in the digital world, as soon as you stop making improvements, you're essentially killing your product, right? Because the world is moving. If you're no longer moving, you're moving backwards, and nobody likes to work with a product that's moving backwards, right? So as soon as you let off the gas in a digital project or a digital product, basically you're just sort of letting it come to a halt, and it's going to not survive in the market. Huh? Now, people might say, ooh, isn't that really expensive, right? I mean, I'm spending so much money on my project already. I can't run this project for like 10 years, right? How much money is this going to cost? Of course, that's where the answer is. You need to get the friction out of your system. You don't do this with 100 people. You do this with 10 people, right? And you do this on rapid feedback cycles. You don't dream up features for the next 10 years. You build things. You observe. You see what works, the three levers we had, right? You get the inventory out. You get the friction out. And you don't build stuff that doesn't have any value. That's how you can fund this. If you try to do this with your traditional model, of course you're going to run out of money, right? You can't keep this 100-person project until infinity. Because probably half of these people are building stuff that's not needed. You know, and another third is just building inventory, which gets, lost, which gets launched like you know, months and months later and doesn't provide any, any customer value. So this is a fundamental shift, but this is ultimately critically important to get into this DevOps mindset. If you're stuck in this project you know, model where the project ends, you don't have DevOps. right? You don't have the mechanisms for that. Right? Another important item to convince in the enterprise, the folks who believe change is risk will think anything that brings more change will break more stuff. Right? We talked about that. That sits pretty deep. 
So one thing you can start doing is you can show people that cloud-based and DevOps-based systems actually have higher system availability. It actually makes your software more reliable. Right? Again, the belief is exactly the other way. They think you, know, you break more stuff, but in reality, you break less stuff. And that is because you have automation, you have version control, right? you have speed, and you have transparency in the infrastructure. And you can lead that kind of conversation saying, these things are the key ingredients into a faster detection and recovery. Right? Traditionally, people worked on maximizing the uptime, the mean time between failure. People bought high quality hardware, they analyzed and studied everything so stuff doesn't break. And that's a useful thing to do, right? It's absolutely not wrong. But then when something does break, they were not well prepared for it. Because they don't have version control, they don't have good monitoring, everybody runs around like crazy, management wants a status update every five minutes, right? What the outage is going on. So it takes them hours and hours and hours, right? Versus you, you have advanced monitoring, you have version control, you can repush the previous state within a minute, and you're back up and running, right? And I always say, having a, a 30 second outage every day is a lot better than having a half day outage once a year, right? You can do the math on this very easily, right? This comes out, and especially the, the 30 second outage, probably people don't even notice, right? They just hit sort of F5 in the browser and they're back up and running, right? So it's a very different model, right? It's minimizing the time to recovery as opposed to just maximizing the time between failure. So this is another angle you need to bring in, in the large enterprise. Now, a lot of resistance against DevOps can come from the operations team. The same is for cloud adoption, right? I work for Google Cloud. So often the operations team say like, no, 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 all this cloud stuff is insecure, unreliable, no, no, we, don't, we don't want this here, right? And often it's not a very rational argument. The argument is often just like, well, they're kind of afraid that they lose their job, right? This cloud thing is you know, supposed to, or it could be replacing a large part of operations. So obviously they're not very happy about it. And the same thing happens with DevOps, right? I always say DevOps starts with Dev. So, you know, the operations folks feel like the developers have taken over and are going to do their job. Now, I always say I don't like the no ops term so much because in the cloud, operational considerations are actually much stronger than on traditional applications, right? Cloud stuff, what does it have to do? It has to be globally load balanced 24 7. You make updates without any downtime. You can scale infinitely up and down anytime. You have circuit breakers, asynchronous message queues, distributed databases. I mean, the operational stuff you have on an internet scale application is a hundred times more complex and more demanding than writing an old monolith with some simple relational database. So operational concerns are much more important. Now, they're generally these operational concerns are at the higher level, right? It's not about, is my server up and running? because that's why you have middleware failover, container orchestration, Kubernetes, you have all that stuff that deals with this. But on the top, you build a highly dynamic system, and that highly dynamic system wants to be operated. Right? Like an autoscaler, right? An autoscaler can go well, but an autoscaler, we've seen examples where an autoscaler falsely scales the whole system down to zero. It has happened, right? Because of like bad feedback loops, right? So, so you need to operate, but you operate at a higher level. So I remind the operations folks, there's more for you to do than ever, as long as you're willing to change and learn some new things, right? Ops doesn't go away, just ops the way we used to do it in 10 years, that, uh, 10 years ago, sorry. That might go away. Ops as overall doesn't go away, it's actually more important than ever, right? It's not dev replaces ops, it's dev and ops working in a different model, right? So I think this is important to remind those folks because otherwise you will get strong resistance. And strong resistance from the operations team is never a good thing, right? Suddenly the firewall change you need will take three months, right? You're not going to put anything, you know, you will have three months of extra software inventory. Congratulations, right? It's not what you want. So one key, um, um, how do you say, one key concept or mechanism in the SRE model is an error budget, right? So you say if you have a certain uptime target, right, a 99.95 is actually quite ambitious, right? It's like 22 minutes a month. So basically, but rather than saying don't touch anything and hope for the best, people start using this budget smartly. Let's say you know, if everything runs very, very well, hmm, maybe you can you know, push a bit more stuff, right? You can evolve the platform more quickly, you deliver more features more quickly. 
maybe slightly increasing the risk, but that comes out of your error budget, so you're still going to meet your SLA. And vice versa, when the error budget is exhausted, everybody works on operations. Right? When the error budget is out, if the stuff doesn't run as well as it should, and you're, you're just about to break your SLA, you shift your resources away from new feature release into making this more stable. So you finally get a very, very nice feedback cycle rather than the, the operations team having to deal with the outages and your know, development just keep on pushing stuff. Here you shift your emphasis based on where you are with your uptime. Right? The most important thing here is to create a feedback cycle. When I was at Allianz, one of the proudest statements I kept on making was, my architects are on call. That was true. We did operations on the architecture team. And I always told people, that is the feedback cycle, right? When we draw a PowerPoint picture, it's not somebody else's problem if it doesn't run. It's our problem because we are on call for our platform. And that is one of the, the key, you build it, you run it, one of those key SRE, SRE mindsets. Right? So as we say, feedback toil, you know, dealing, you know, being up at night, dealing with, with silly outages, toil is a very effective form of feedback for developers. Nobody likes to do that. Right? So if there's a lot of toil, a lot of waste in this, people will go and fix it. Right? As long as the pain hits them. If the pain hits somebody else, it's easy to say, oh, you know, we'll fix it in the next release. Right? And the key thing here, and I said, the operations is equally important. And I'm not so sure I actually 100% like the slogan of the kingmakers for the developers because it kind of pitches a little bit the developers versus operations. But what I do like is that I would say the development mindset is something that permeates through the whole organization, right? And this is what SRE did, right? SRE brought the development mindset to the operations part. Looking at the business context, right, and where sort of these things are coming for the new kingmakers is, if IT is the differentiator for your business, then the developers are the ones who deliver the software, and if that is the key differentiator for your business, the developers are some of the most important people. That's, that's what they mean by the kingmakers. And I would say that part is true. So you need to be careful. This is not about pitching dev versus ops. This is saying for the business side of things, if software delivery is what drives your business, then the people who make that software are very, very important people, and you should make sure they're happy. Right? This is not something you outsource somewhere and make a, a five-year fixed cost contract. Right? This becomes a core competency. This is something you want to have in-house, you want to hire good people, and you want to treat them well. One thing that people often ask about, oh, so what about the architects in this DevOps thing? Right? Because it's Dev and Ops, where is architecture? Here's a nice slogan from Martin Fowler and Eric Dernenberg where they said, well, you know, the stuff that the architects usually have done, we can do this as easily by the developers, by the tools, or not at all. And as a former chief architect, I actually agree with this statement, oops, because of the word traditionally. Right? What have architects done traditionally? Draw glass diagrams, tell people how many characters a line of code has, right? say what percentage test coverage you should have. Right? Those are the things architects used to do, and that is no longer what the architects should be doing. The architects now should be working on getting the software delivery flow functioning. Right? They should make sure that the software you build has value, is aligned with the business strategy, make sure you take the friction out of the system. That is exactly what, what the architects should be doing, no longer like drawing class diagrams. So as we'll see, is that the DevOps story is a lot more than you know, just you know, doing DevOps and having Chef and Puppet or Ansible or some sort of automated deployment. Really, it's about transforming IT. Right? It seems like a small change, but it is actually a big change in people's heads, right? because they learned to do it a certain way for like 20 years, right? and now you're changing the way, and as I said, it's not just learning something new, it's people have to unlearn the way it has to be done. But there's many frameworks that sort of raise your awareness. I wouldn't say, I don't believe there's a framework that is a recipe for transformation and change. It's not that easy. But there are frameworks that sort of help you think about and understand what is needed. You know, and here's sort of a classic one. This is you know, from Cotter, I think, right? Sort of you know, famous you know, marketing organizational management people. And they say, Really, the way change starts with a sense of urgency, right? And then 
once you have the sense of urgency, you can build this guiding coalition, right? You can have a vision. Hey, people, we're going to go here. We're going to release software 10 times a day, and our customers will be happy, and we make constant improvement, right? Then you need to get some volunteers, right? You need some people to help you. Not everybody will, but some volunteers will. And then you get this going. Interesting relationship to this at Allianz, we actually got quite far where we built the private cloud platform and really changed the way they delivered software, right? From approval cycles over months and months and months into fully automated sort of Jenkins Farm, CI, CD, Cloud Foundry, Pass, you know, everything, right? It's just like push software through. And we were actually quite successful until we hit this acceleration, so the scaling through the organization. So we found a lot of volunteers, everybody loved it, we removed a lot of barriers, we had a lot of short-term wins, and then it was hard to scale this through the organization, right? The early adopters were happy, many people call this the chasm, right? It's like sort of the chasm between the early adopters and the late adopters, and we had a very difficult time crossing that chasm. And looking back, what I believe the key hurdle was, we didn't have the sense of urgency. So we got ahead of ourselves successfully, very successfully. We covered all this, but because we didn't have the basis in the organization, we didn't have that base of a sense of urgency, ultimately this came to a stop. Right? There were few people who felt the sense of urgency and really valued a rapid software delivery and the whole DevOps model. And there was many other people who was like, oh, every quarter we have record profit, every year my bonus gets better. Hmm, you know, why should I worry so much about this? And that really inhibited the, 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 scale, the scope of the change that we could do, right? So, so the models don't give you a recipe for success, but they give you a good checklist to not forget about items, right? Because this will catch up with you, this will catch up with you um, ultimately. Now, when you try to bring change into an organization, there's a few different models you can, you can do, right? Normally, if you want to change the way people work, you send somebody there to tell them, right? So the green is like the new in this way, right? You send somebody to work with the gray guys, and the, and the green person is going to show the gray people how the green way, you know, the DevOps way of, of, um, of working actually uh, functions. I call this a missionary, right? You send somebody off, right? And they teach them sort of a new, great way of doing things. A friend of mine actually, and, and you know, this sounds like a noble thing to do, right? As you go somewhere, you teach people how this thing works. It is not nearly as easy as it looks. And a friend of mine said this in a very nice way. He said, many early missionaries turned into food right? when they went somewhere to teach people a new way of doing things. They were eaten, basically, by the cannibals, right? So being, being a missionary can be a very difficult job, especially in an organization where the management structure is still the old one. You might find support from the team, but because these gray folks here, they still report to a manager, to their manager, to their manager, their bonus plan, their incentive systems, their status reports, their budget approvals, that is all still the old way. So getting this to change is extremely hard, right? Sounds like a noble thing to do. In reality, not easy to do. So one thing you can do, turn this around. So rather than sending somebody over, you invite them in. And at Allianz, we did this quite a bit. We call this the boot camp. I think my remote control here. Oh, there we go. My remote control is a little weak. Sorry about it. It's a boot camp. So this is me at work, right? Yeah, I'm a nice guy at conferences. At work, I'm really tough, right? It's like, I want people, boot camp, right? Yeah, and that has the advantage that when people come into the boot camp, the new way of working is the new normal. There's no arguing, right? You're falling into an environment where it's just different, right? It's sink or swim, or rather swim or sink, hopefully, right? So you should be swimming, right? So that has a big advantage. Now, of course, the part of the boot camp is the boot camp lasts a certain amount of time, and then you send the people back into the organization. At that point, two things can happen, right? Either they become missionaries, which you know, sort of the same challenges, or you can cycle enough people through the boot camp that little after little, you can convert the whole team. Right? The other thing that worked in this case unintentionally well for our team was that a lot of folks who came for the boot camp didn't want to go back. So it was a good recruiting mechanism for our team. They just stayed. Because our boot camp wasn't that bad, actually. It was quite a lot of fun, our boot camp, right? So they didn't want to go back. So it was great for recruiting for our team, but it wasn't as great for transforming the organization, right? Because they didn't go back. And after I discussed with a few more folks around it, we realized that there's another model that seems much harsher, 
but that actually works relatively well if you can do it. You pull the people out little by little in this boot camp, but you never send them back. You're basically rebuilding the function that they used to do in a new environment. So basically you're replacing the old team with the new team, but largely with the same people. Right? You take them out one by one, you get them to work in the new environment, but with a new environment, they're basically replacing the job that the old team did. Right? Seems like a pretty hard thing to do, but you do it with the same people, and therefore you're not you know, getting rid of people, you're teaching the people a better way of doing it, rather than sending them back into the existing management structure, you keep them in the new management structure. And we call this the shanghai right? Where people sort of get pulled on the boat, right, and sailed off. It's a friendly version of shanghai As always, there's a catch. The catch here is, in order to make this successful, you need some strong captains, right? You need some people who can pull the folks on board and work with them and not just teach them the new way of working, but actually do the new way of working, right? You are going to be the new team, so you need to deliver. So you need some strong captains. The other thing is, in this environment, the real losers are the management that used to manage the old team, right? Because ultimately, you hollow out the team, you move people little by little under a new structure, and the old manager at some point doesn't have a lot of people anymore, right? And that is the tough part. That can bring some friction, but that is also a strong message, right? If these managers learn the new way of working, that's great. They can be a captain on the new ship, but if they don't, the team will be gone at some point and they have nothing more to do, right? So in the end, not one is guaranteed to be successful, but overall it's good to have this repertoire of change models. In the end, we did a little bit of both, right? We did this in the beginning, then we did a lot of boot camp, and at the end we sort of cranked this up a little bit and we actually did much more shanghai where the new team would ultimately replace the existing team with many folks, including many folks out of ops, right? They were all there, they just worked in a, in a new environment. Now, none of this works if you can't bring some new talent in, right? What's very important to me is that if an organization has a hard time working in a new way, it's usually the system's fault, not the people's fault, right? So generally, the people can be taught a new way of working, especially in this boot camp Shanghai model. But you need to have some people to teach them, right? So I was joking you know, last night at dinner, I think, we, one problem we had when we worked in an organization, we had all these people who were in charge, in charge of transformation, but they never seen the target picture, right? They never seen a digital company or company that really has a DevOps way of working. They never seen it, right? So I was joking last night, this is as, as me taking a job as a tour guide in Zimbabwe. I've never been there. I will read some books, look at some maps, right? And I'm sure I can tell people some things to go see, but I can't be a decent tour guide because I've never ever been there. So you need some people who have been there. And you can do this to some extent with external consultants, but it's much better if you bring the people on board. So that's where recruiting talent is extremely important. And of course, there's always two aspects to having the right people. The one is bring good people in, and the second one is don't lose good people, right? Because if your culture isn't, isn't adjusted, and now you're teaching people, I mean, I did this at Allianz, right? You're teaching them, you know, like Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, Docker, Kubernetes, you know, um, Ansible, Automation, DevOps. Their market value just goes through the roof, right? Like suddenly, you know, rather than being an insurance, you know, COBOL developer, right? Now they're the hottest item on the market, so you really need to make sure they're happy because otherwise, you know, you do a fantastic transformation for somebody else, right? Because they're gonna go. So, so that is not what you want. So you need to make sure they're happy. Now, the interesting thing is big companies often feel that they can't offer what a Google can offer, right? Everybody wants to work for a Google or Facebook. What can I offer as, or a startup company, what can I offer? In the end, I've, we found actually that you could offer quite a bit, right? In a large organization, it's very international, very multicultural. You can go into national assignments, right? Allianz is 145,000 people all around the planet. You can go work in Singapore, you can work in France, you can work in Germany. It's a very complex and fun business, business domain. It's actually interesting business. Also, you get to work with some incredibly talented people, right? Like the board of Allianz, these are people running a 125 billion euro company. They are heavy duty, right? I mean, these are world-class business leaders. So working in a company like that, right, and learning from those folks, there's a lot to offer, 
right? Often the organization stands in its own way of delivering these benefits to the engineers. That's the problem. It's not like they can't offer something compelling. It's often they don't because you know, they're kind of, you know, sort of paralyzed internally with HR rules. But I believe as a large company, you have a lot to offer. There's a lot of people, smart people, complex business domains, right? International, right? There's a lot of things big companies have that a company of three people cannot, right? It's also many things the other way around, but it's not as easy to say, oh, everybody wants to work for a little startup company and it's hard to compete with as a large company, right? So here's the things you can do, right? Offer people a technical career path, right? At Google, you can become a senior vice president as a programmer. Right? No reports, individual contributor, no problem at all. Right? HR will stand in your way, but there's no reason in a large company you cannot do this. Right? Why not? Right? There's no, no law book that says developers you know, can be very, very senior in, in the organization. You know, provide training, provide people the right kind of tools. Right? Take, some, same, take some frictions out. Make sure managers are not micromanagers, but managers are mostly there to get blockers out of the way. Right? And if the managers are busy getting blockers out of the way, they also very much don't have time to do micromanagement, right? And then there's a reason salary is last because, you know, money is important, but money doesn't fix any problems, right? If you have a fundamental problem in the organization, paying people more will make it worse because in the end, you will get the people who only do it for the money and the people who actually want to do good things go somewhere else, right? Like you, you want to be fair and compensate people fairly, but you don't want to try to fix problems with money. You cannot buy your way to a transformation. Right? You need to do this through the culture. You cannot do this with money. That is a, is a very, important, very important lesson. Right? So in the end, what's, what's very clear here is that this whole DevOps story is just one part of a larger transformation. Right? People think, like, oh, let's do some DevOps. That's why I say just adopting DevOps won't work. Right? If you want to get into more DevOps style of working, you need to really consider this is really a transformation, right? And transformations are difficult, right? They're interesting, they're challenging, they can be fun, they can be extremely valuable for an organization. They can actually be the only thing that, um, that basically in the end makes the survival of the organization, right? Transformation can be the thing that saves the business, but they aren't easy, right? The one thing they're not is easy, and they're not short term either. Right? So you need to be prepared to put a lot of energy in and you need to be prepared to, to do this for, for the long run. Right? So really, you know, a DevOps adoption doesn't work. It's really a DevOps transformation. The same thing is putting all the new tools in doesn't do anything. You need to change the mindset for people to actually use the tools. Right? And always talking about the shiny object, the pie in the sky. Oh, we're going to be like Google, Facebook, whatever. That doesn't do anything actually do something that moves you in the right direction, right? Making a small step is much better than talking about, oh, next year we're going to fly on vacation, whatever. It never happens, right? Leaving the house and walking 100 meters is worth a lot more than talking about where you could be going someday that you actually never do. Fortunately, a lot of large companies fall into this trap. So here you can see the difference, right? A lot of companies do the things on the left-hand side because it's easy easy to talk about the pie in the sky, it's easy to buy some tools, and it's easy to say, oh, we're going to adopt DevOps, right? Everything is going to be great, right? In the end, that doesn't work. So doing something easy that doesn't work is a pretty useless task to do, right? You want to do something that actually achieves the, the results. Oops, a little. And with that, actually, I come to, to the end. I think we're just about out of time as well. And I wasn't going to end with an empty slide. Hold on, people. Something is funny here. I was going to end with a very glorious slide, right? So this is you guys, right? The cowboys riding into the sunset, right? Cowboys and cowgirls, right? So in the end, where did we start, right? DevOps is there because business wants stuff faster, right? IT is always too slow and too expensive. So DevOps is, in fact, a key vehicle to make this work. So they have the right idea. The challenge is there's a lot of stuff in large organizations that make that idea not work, right? And we saw some of the things you have to be doing in order to get this to work. And you realize that it's not a matter of tools or shiny objects. You know, it's a matter of really changing mindset. And it's really part of a transformation, which is not like a six-week project, right? but it's an ongoing journey. Now, the nice thing about the journey, I think it's actually a very, um, a very rewarding journey to transform an organization. So I would leave you with that message. right? Be prepared for the, for the long run. 
but enjoy the ride along the way. Thank you very much.